shut up and sit down. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us and uh, for reaching out after we saw the trailer for your documentary. Um, Ellie found the trailer and uh, we're such massive fans of Flight of the Navigator that it was uh, definitely within our wheelhouse. Um, and, you know, and but I think uh, what we loved about the documentary was the fact that it not only tells the story of Flight of the Navigator, but it also tells Joey Kramer's story as well, which was you know, in all parts, fascinating, heartbreaking, um, uplifting, and uh, you know, it was it was a heck of a journey. Huh? That he <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. We both grew up with the movie. I feel like um, it was on TV just pretty much every day growing up. It was I must have watched it a hundred times, and I had no idea of about what he went through. It was incredible yeah. to see that. Well, it was interesting because during the research for the film, when I had Googled Joey, as most people do, you watch the film and go, I wonder what happened to him. Um, I didn't even know. This was about a year after he had robbed the bank and I had somehow missed all the headlines. So I was incredibly shocked when, you know, it's to, to have this kid that you grew up with and you think you could be friends with. And then you're like, how does, how does that happen? Where, how, how did he get from flight of the navigator to jail so it was this yeah it's an incredible incredibly strange bizarre inspiring story when you actually find out what happened yeah I, I particularly loved how you kind of interwove the story of flight of the navigator with the story of joey in the documentary i think if it was if it was just kind of 45 minutes of joey's story that could have actually been quite heavy and, and difficult to watch but i think the way it was interwoven with one of our childhood favorite movies was um that that was really masterful the way you told that story well thank you i'll take that um <laughs> but it yeah, I mean, it was interesting because Life After Flash was the first documentary I did along the same lines of Flash Gordon and then Sam J. Jones and what happened to him and his life story. Um, because there's so many, it seems like there's so many of these kind of making of documentaries that are coming out at the moment, starting from, I think, like Back in Time was probably the first one that kind of opened the floodgates a little bit. Um, and so I wanted that point of difference. And I knew from talking to people that some people really wanted to know about the film and some people was, were really interested in the human side of it. So I just thought that's a really nice way to celebrate a film, give people something a bit more interesting to watch, um, maybe an inspiring message and um, just have that point of difference with everything else that was coming out. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. And then I, I was wondering how you personally got into filmmaking. What was the, the story behind that? I had always wanted to be in media. I actually wanted to be an actor growing up. Um, I would like collect the magazines with the Oscar awards and the Emmy awards and like pick my dress. And it was gonna be like the little mermaid with a little pearl eardrop, you know, earrings. And um, I, my parents were always really supportive. And they said, look, if you're gonna to wanna to be an actor, at least have a backup career. So I thought, well, the best backup career to have is one that I can write my own stuff and make my own stuff and so I did a bachelor's in TV production in country Australia and realized that I wasn't very good at acting and it probably wasn't the best choice anyway um, and I just really enjoyed the idea of being creative and directing and kind of being a bit more in control than you can with acting um, so it helped that I wasn't very good at acting because it kind of led me down the other path. Um, and I did a, my first documentary was about the Dalai Lama sister in India when I was at university. And after that, um, that had a quite a good reception at a festival. So I thought, well, you know, maybe this is something that I could do. And then I moved into travel documentaries, adventure, travel. Um, and then Life After Flash was my real kind of first own documentary project. I had directed a scripted feature a few years prior, but um, this was kind of my first, like, come up with the idea, raise the money, make it happen, and navigate it was second. So it's kind of been always there, um, but I'm now trying not to work for other production companies and trying to do my own thing. <laughs> nice, yeah. It's always best to be your own boss, right? I, uh, yeah, completely. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and and why why Flash and, and Navigator? What was it about those movies, or was it more about the the stories of the individuals in those movies that drew you to those? Well, I didn't know their stories before I started. So with Sam, I knew rumors that they, something had happened on set, but I didn't know if it was true. With Joe, all I knew was what was on the Wikipedia page. Um, so Flash kind of happened just organically. I had a mutual friend of Sam's that she had worked with him on a TV show called The Jump, which you may know being 
British, yeah. um, where they kind of ski jumps and everyone gets injured. And so Sam got injured. So he was never on TV, but she got to know him in the hospital. And her and I were just chatting at a party, talking about what we had been doing. And I had just missed Sam and Melody at a Comic-Con and I was really gutted. So when she mentioned she knew Sam, I got really excited and we started talking about what he had done realizing I didn't know what his story was and I thought maybe that would be interesting to do and so I wrote up a treatment pitched it uh ended up skyping Sam and a few months later we were out filming with him and then as we were doing Life After Flash I realized that I wanted it to be a series started thinking about other films that we could do and just was like well what did I grow up with what did I love well Flight of the Navigator let's google Joey see what happened and then it just snowballed from there and then I tracked him down we became pen pals while he was still in jail yeah. um and then when he got out a few months later a couple of months later I went out and started filming with him in person so it kind of just all happened the way I feel like it was supposed to happen um, Flash kind of found me and then Navigator just seemed like a really easy second choice, <laughs> especially when you read his story, you know, it's incredible. Yeah. I think it really shows as well that your connection to the movie kind of um, out, like, is the primary motivator because it, it's understandable that you would hear about Joe's story and that would be kind of what would draw you to this project, but it, it really shows that your connection to the movie was kind of the primary force behind pulling this together. And I, I think what comes across is um, like a genuine look at what he went through. And just from the very beginning, there's an optimism, like you're not kind of, it's not kind of salacious and reveling in the challenges that he faced. It, it's incredibly sympathetic, but it, I loved the optimism from the very beginning of the movie that you're not kind of oh I wonder where he's at now from the very beginning like you you because you set it up that he's meeting the co-stars again from the very beginning so it, I, I just really love that heart and optimism that that really kind of flowed through the whole movie. Well thank you and that was really important to me and that was what I had relayed both to Sam and to Joe I was like I don't want this to be some kind of TV one hour car crash, where are they now expose thing. It's like, well, their stories are mine to tell. So I want to allow them to tell it how they want to tell it, you know, and I'll just capture it. And I didn't want to make anything um, into something that it wasn't, or like you say, salacious kind of filmmaking. Um, so that was really important to me. So they did see early edits of it to make sure that I was Every, having everything in context and I wasn't kind of misrepresenting them or their story and um, you know that was really important to me for them to be able to trust me enough to share these stories um, you know they didn't, they didn't have to they didn't know me from a bar of soap really when I met them Joe and I had a had formed a connection with the letter writing initially which was really a lovely touch I think but yeah it was definitely something that we we knew that we wanted their story to have some kind of inspirational message towards the end but the interesting thing about Joe's story is like we didn't know what how it was going to end like we met him when he had first come he just got out of jail and he had been telling us all these stories about how so many times he's relapsed for the last 10-15 years so it's like well I don't know what is going to happen in three years. I hope you're going to be good. You know, we would love to have it end how it does in the film. His story is still going on though. Um, but it does kind of cross your mind. It's like, well, what happens if he does relapse? You know, we'll keep filming, but you know, so it was always in the back of my head that maybe that would be a possibility. But he said to me, it was never for him. He said, this time I knew it would be different. So wow. yeah, I think he's, he's got all his, his, his plan worked out this time. Yeah, I, I particularly liked it, actually, that although you had the optimism, you also, it was kind of an unflinching look at what he'd been through. And I think, <clears throat> you know, it's so important for addicts to to acknowledge what they've done and, and be be open and honest with themselves. And there was a lot of kind of self-awareness, I thought, in, in Joe's story, but it also came across as very raw. And it, it amazed me that you actually had footage from the jail, footage from the rehab center with other people who were going through it. And, you know, that, that made it seem so so much real and, and large, you know? Well, that was a really important aspect that I wanted was I had always said to him, you know what, I would love to film back at the jail. And what's really great is that he has such a great relationship with them. And they're so, maybe it's a Canadian thing, they're so friendly and so welcoming. Um, I just made sure that I planned in advance and did all the right paperwork and they just let us 
be shown around the jail and film. And obviously I sent them a section of the edit to make sure that I'm not showing faces or names that I shouldn't to make sure they're happy. Um, but it was a really important part because I think it's it was important to show that it was also a jail that was good for rehabilitation. You know, you can see that it's an environment that is there to help them get better and stay out of jail as opposed to just lock them up, make some money out of them, however it works. And, you know, it um, it's just such a caring environment that I think they were so key. And also he robbed the bank to get in that program. So it was really important to him as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was, we were definitely very lucky with the access and, and showing his story. And, and we had kind of talked about that and said at the beginning, you know, if we're going to, show people how far you've come we really need to show people where you were so seeing that street that he used to live on in vancouver was just so surreal because you you when you talk to him and you see him you're like i can't picture him ever being in jail or being homeless or like it's it just it, like you can't associate him with that knowing how good his heart is so um, yeah, we were very lucky with the access and the ability to to show his true story of everything that happened. Yeah, I, I thought that was incredible. And, and you know, I, I think for people who are not familiar with addiction and the battles of rehabilitation, there's a perception that you just join, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous and you join some 12 step program and you're magically fixed. And, you know, I, I think what really came across in the documentary to me was how long term these challenges can be. And, and the fact that Joe wanted to be in there for three years, like that was his goal, not not three months or, or you know, a short mm. prison center. And, and, and that, you know, and, and that he wanted to be there. It wasn't a punishment. It was something that he thought would actually help him. Well, exactly. And they, they say that, don't they, about people in addiction, they have to want to fix themselves. But like Joe said, and I didn't realize this is how it works. Like if you want to go to rehab, you can't just call and go. You know, I didn't realize there would be waiting lists and you have to be a sober for a certain amount of days before they'll let you in. And so there is, there are a lot of hurdles just for someone to, to get into rehab in the first place. So, you know, it was that case of he didn't know what else to do. But like you say, to have the foresight of going, okay, I'm going to do this. I need to do this for a year. I can't just do it for three months because it's, uh, it's not going to work. Um, so he's doing really well, which is really, which is really nice. Yeah, I, I was amazed as well. And we, we've, we've done some kind of homeless outreach work here in the States. And I'm always blown away by the stories that the homeless people have to tell. And there's, there's a kind of wisdom that comes from what they've been through and endured, and especially the ones who are kind of uh, clawing their way out of that. And it, it's not easy, but the, the, there, there's a special kind of wisdom that they gain through that experience. And I think Joe, you know, talked a lot towards the end of the documentary that, that really kind of resonated with me. There was some, particularly the scene where he's looking in the mirror and talking about people need to, people need to feel love, but also love from themselves. I thought that was such a powerful message um, that, you know, most people may not even think about. Yeah, I, I, it's very true. And he, he has this kind of outlook on life and his sense of self that's kind of unlike anyone else that I have met you know he's which is why you kind of say you look at him and talk to him and you can't imagine him ever doing this stuff and one of the most eye-opening points for me was when we were filming on that street in Vancouver where all the homeless people are and you know it's quite intimidating so I was there even though I was with him I was like trying not to film people's faces and you know trying to be respectful but you're still nervous about being in that environment and um, a couple of people had said something when we stopped filming and, and Joe went over and explained what we were doing. And they were like, if you would just come and talk to us at the beginning, like we're all human. If you would just come and talk to us, explain what you're doing, we would have been cool. We would have. And I, and so for me, that was a really big learning experience to just be reminded, you know, Joe was in that position. They all have, they all got there somehow, you know, and people are so quick to judge them as their, their human characters and their stories about why they got there. And so that for me was kind of a big moment where I go, you know what, I should have gone and just like spoken to them and not being intimidated. And um, so I have huge respect for the work you do because it's, you know, like you say, working with homeless outlets and um, it's a huge issue that um, would be, you know, if people see them 
on a more human level, then maybe we can help more people, you know, and I would love to show this film, use this documentary to help people in certain situations. I know that Joe's getting emails from people who had been in his situation and are in his situation um, saying that, you know what, I can see that you've got yourself out of it. So maybe there's hope for me, which is really nice. And I know that's really important for people to, to have that response for, for Joe as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it really showed as well. I think the 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 depth that you put into kind of the the rehab process that he went through, it highlighted the journey that he'd gone on and that it was a conscious decision every day to kind of make a good choice every day and like every like every day was a series of choices and um, like while he may have not necessarily made the best choice in getting into the prison, it was it, it highlighted how valuable that rehab facility was in the prison, but also how rare it was. I mean, I, I haven't heard of any prisons that have that. I mean, like prisons have those kind of rehab facilities. They have programs to help people who have addiction um, challenges. But it but that kind of rehab facility that was really um open that like they said the value of being able to go outside and kind of have that kind of autonomy of taking yourself outside and going for a walk um kind of through the forest and you know around the lake and that kind of thing it, it kind of highlighted the value of that but also how rare that is as mm -hmm. well that as much as he had challenges he was incredibly lucky to be able to go to that kind of facility and that isn't something that's open to many people no, exactly. And it, it completely surprised me as well. You know, like he says, they have you on a first name basis and they have such a respect for the people in there as opposed to treating them like an animal. You know, I had imagined to, that I was going to go to this jail with like you see in the movies and, the, you know, as you think a jail is going to be with like the heavy doors and everyone's like kind of really standoffish and the, there's such a separation between the inmates and but they don't call them inmates at Guthrie they're residents and there is this just real respect and hope that people can not come back you know that's such a the focus for them and they have mentorship programs so Joe when he arrived was mentored by other residents that would kind of coach him through what he's going to experience and then when he the further that he went in his sentence. And then when he got out, he still goes back now and mentors other people. And he goes back to the jail and talks to current residents about his journey and what he's learned. And so it's this, it, yeah, I just had no idea it would be like that. And it completely surprised me. And you can see why he really wanted to, to go there. And it's nice to know that there are places that are about rehabilitation as opposed to just kind of throwing someone, someone away and um, locking away the key. <laughs> Was there anything out of interest when you were working with Joe that you found, you know, particularly that you learned from him? Were there any things that really jumped out at you? Oh, such a big question. <laughs> um, how, I guess, how optimistic he is. You know, the thing, I can't imagine ever going through the things that he did. And for him to have the strength to go through all of that, share his story which I know he was nervous about you know there were times when he didn't know that people still enjoyed the film he didn't want to be associated with the film um and some of his friends had disconnected with him through all the things that he had done and he just had this he like eternal optimism about life you know totally glass half full for everything um and just to kind of see him talk through what he went through and how he overcame it and even day-to-day -day things like the thing in the mirror that he does and just each day we film with him he would kind of talk about a topic or talk about how he's approaching things or changing his outlook on things like he doesn't say the word but anymore because that negates what's just been said he says although and so just it was just an amazing way of kind of thinking about life and being excited about life again you know and it I certainly can't have any complaints you know if something bugs me I'm like well I really don't have it that bad <laughs> you know compared to what people like Joe have been through so definitely just an outlook on life it's so inspiring that's amazing yeah and as you say it uh, puts things in perspective when you uh, you know people that have been really? through like I, you know I lose a pair of glasses or you know it's <laughs> like sometimes it's the end of the world if you're having a bad day or whatever or but it just it, it definitely gives it 
it gives your life perspective for sure. Absolutely. How about from the point of view of the Flight of the Navigator movie, was there anything that you learned through making this documentary that uh, really jumped out at you about the, the movie or changed your perspective on it? Uh, I think just hearing, I mean, because you know how real the ship is. And I think that's what makes the film special. I think that what is what makes a lot of 80s films special. But I think just when he talks about it, you know, and, and to know how he's feeling, like now we can watch Flight of the Navigator and know that he is like thinking about this moment in his life to get that emotion out, you know, thinking about his missing his friends at school to 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 get those tears out and then just how he feels being in that ship with all the puppets and thinking the Puck Marin's real. And then it's just, I think it um, just gives you a more interesting perspective on what his experience as a child actor was instead of just watching it objectively and going, oh, you know, it's a really great film. Um, and also all the little tidbits of the making of and things were always really fun as well to find out. Um, but yeah, I think just getting an idea of his feeling and what he was going through when he was filming it was really interesting. I think that was the other thing that struck me about kind of that side of the movie of the the making of was I, I feel like sometimes, especially if someone's gone through challenges and they were a child actor, they can, there's some kind of cynicism that comes across and they talk about the long hours or the challenges they face or the difficult relationships. Whereas he only spoke about the joy that he felt in the movie and just he, he you, you could tell kind of how lucky he felt being part of that. I mean, even though like you say, like there, there were times that he had no idea how much impact it had on so many people and how many people grew up with it and like not just remembered the movie, that it was kind of a formative movie for a lot of people. Um, but hearing the joy that he talked about the movie and I, I really loved, I, I guess like kind of going back to the optimism that he has kind of going through life and taking each day at a time that, that he... I'm, I'm sure it's, it, I'm sure that there were negative aspects as well, but hearing the joy that he talked about the movie and um, like, I really love that story that, that he was the, that, that he was the, the, um, the belch that they had. The, <laughs> yes. When that, I, I, yeah. that was so fun. And just the pride that he had, that he was part of this bigger picture and yeah. just that he w was remembering all these tiny pictures, the, these tiny elements of that movie with such joy. I, I really loved that side of it. I guess that actually um, is probably a good point to answer your last question about anything that I found out. I think it is it is such a cliche with child actors to go, oh, child actors has gone off the rails again. And, and it's easy to, to blame an experience on set, like a particular movie. Maybe they weren't looked after, or maybe the hours were too long, or maybe, you know, there are a lot of stories at the moment coming out of what happens to children, especially in the 80s in film. And and that they're not protected. But what was really lovely to discover about this is that his downfall, yes, it was part because he was an actor and he was bullied at school. And then it was how he was perceived by his friends, but it wasn't because of what happened on set. And his experience on Navigator was actually really positive and just like a family. And that was really nice to know because you want, to think that he had a really great time. And when you see them all at the reunion, they hadn't seen him, you know, Randall was 26 years and everyone else was 35 years that they hadn't seen him. But the way they talked about him before they saw him and the way they interacted with him, you can tell that everyone has such a great time and everyone really cared for each other. So I think it, it would have been really disappointed to find out that maybe his downfall was caused by his experience on Flight of the Navigator. So to know it wasn't, that was a really nice learning experience for me yeah that's amazing i i also i another thing that kind of jumped out at me watching the documentary was um how joe was successful as a child actor because he was so emotionally accessible and yet that sort of that emotional rawness and and um you know that that 
kind of caused him a lot of challenges and and uh, as he as he grew older and especially the the points around hollywood forgetting child actors as they they're kind of they're not children anymore they're they're, they're a commodity that's that's ended and um it was just really interesting i thought you know his uh, his greatest asset being being able to tap into those emotions was um, was also a vulnerability um that he's now started to to build an identity around and bring back into the world i thought that that was incredible yeah, and it's not something that I had ever put two and two together until Matt Adler had mentioned it, where he does say that. And, um, you know, he is, he's so emotional, Joey. Like, the amount of times he cried in interviews was, I mean, nearly every, <laughs> nearly every interview, you know, whether it was happy tears or sad tears, but all those emotions are so on the surface, even, you know, however many years later. It, you can see how that would happen. You know, this little kid that's so emotional, that is so vulnerable because of that when he starts to go through hard times. And I guess it's how to process that. But he's still he's still pretty emotional today, but in a good way. Right, yes. <laughs> you know, it's, good that he can, it's good now because he's learned to harness that and use it to talk about his feelings and talk it through and process it and channel it into something else, which is, you know, I guess full circle back to channeling it into that character. Yeah, and just amazing to know that his story is now helping other people. I, I I love that. We do too. That was, you know, it was we we didn't know how it was going to be received. I was really nervous showing the final cut to Joey. He was really nervous people seeing it for the first time because you don't know how people are going to react. So you know, we're we're happy that the first like the first review was really positive and it seems to be snowballing, which is really nice. That's amazing. I guess our, our last question for you was what's next for Life After Movies? Do you have any, any future plans? We do. We have um, one we started filming for actually before lockdown, which is Life After a Treyu. So Never Ending Story and oh, Noah Happy. Oh. <laughs> so excited. Um, we, yeah, we started filming with, our first interview, interview was with Lamal. Um, we went to Germany to interview Klaus Doldinger, who was the composer. Um, of the original score. We were, we started filming with Noah and Tammy in Liverpool Comic Con and we had then plans in April to do this great American trip and interview Deep Roy and Wolfgang Peterson and more interviews with Noah and then lockdown hit. So waiting, waiting <laughs> to get back out. But we uh, managed to interview a guy called Colin Arthur who designed and built all this, the props. So he built the Falcor. I have a little piece of Falcor is fur on my desk. No he's got my goodness. Um, he did the rock fighter. He worked a lot with Ray Harryhausen with like the Kraken and um, Jason and the Argonauts, those kind of movies. So wow. um, it, it was an amazing interview that we got just as lockdown lifted in the UK and now we're back down again. So as soon as we can do more filming, I'll keep going with that. Um, and we've got like four or five in different stages of being in the works, but we're not announcing anything yet until they're a bit further down the line, but never ending story will be the next one. Oh my goodness. I'm very excited that you're mining <laughs> our childhood to bring us. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm living vicariously trying to reclaim my childhood. So it's a magical time in film, you know, and it just, it's like Matt says in the documentary, we won't see those kind of films again. So I'm trying to cling on to my childhood as much as possible. Definitely. And with those kind of movies that were, they were really groundbreaking. And not that ground isn't still being broken in movies, but like when they were, like when they were talking about kind of um, the reflection mapping of the ship and how they were designing the ship and how that that changed how movies are made. And I feel like there, there are so many movies from our childhood that really kind of defined new genres. And um, I did look into a little bit the actor who played Atreyu and um, it was, it's, it's, it's interesting to see those child actors that you kind of, you've watched the movie so many times, you feel like you know them and then learning about the choices they made after that movie is so incredibly interesting. And I'm so excited to hear more about that. <laughs> He, I mean, he has a fascinating story as well. So I'm very excited to learn more about it because I only know so much, you know, we haven't done our full sit down interview with him yet. So I know bits and pieces, um, but I always love discovering the, the layers of the onion to be cliche. You know, the more you talk to them and the more you find out. So yeah, I'm really excited about that one. 
Amazing. <laughs> um, well, that, that was all the questions we had for you. And we really, really appreciate you taking the time to chat to us today, Lisa. And thank you so much for the life after the Navigator movie. We, uh, we thoroughly enjoyed it. It was fantastic. Uh, we well, rewatched um, The Flight of the Navigator with, well, we rewatched it. Our children watched it for the first time. And they are teenagers. They hate everything. And yet we couldn't, like, they couldn't even keep their giggles in when they were watching some of it. It was so fun to watch it kind of through them again and kind of remember what it was like watching it for the first time. So, um, but seeing the the kind of the depth that you explored in the documentary just really added to that experience of kind of remembering the movie. So I, I just, I'm so excited to follow the rest of your projects. <laughs> Well, thank you. And I love the concept that you do of the picking a trailer that the other hasn't seen. I think that's really sweet. So yeah, I'm excited to keep seeing what you're doing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, we'll uh, yeah, we'll be in touch when, uh, certainly when you get to the never ending story. We're oh, my uh, goodness, yes. such huge fans and uh, can't wait to see what you do with that. Thank you. Well, hopefully it'll be out next year if we can keep filming. But... Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, Top fingers engagement. crossed. Well, awesome we'll let you get back to your daily so but thank you so much for hanging out with us and answering our questions and for an amazing documentary and enjoy well, your thank you mom <laughs> yes i will i will it'd be nice to be cooked for <laughs> shut up and sit down